Factor number 29, synthetic polymers. All right, let's define polymers first by going through the process addition polymerization. Now, ethene is a simple alkene and can be produced by cracking. The cracking part is already given in the crude oil chapter. Now, the smallest hydrocarbon containing carbon-carbon double bond is ethene itself. There are different ways of representing ethene. You can see the molecular formula, the condensed structural formula, the displayed formula, and even the model. Now, when you see it like this, under the right condition, this molecule containing carbon-carbon double bond can join together to produce very long chains after the double bond has been converted into a single bond. Part of double bond is broken to become a single bond. The electrons in that part are used to join its neighboring molecules. The entire process is known as polymerization and joining up the little molecules, ethene in this case, are known as monomers. We make one big molecule that is known as a polymer. When I say these words, let me define them. The word mono means one in Latin and the word mer means unit. So when I use the word polymer, the poly means more than one, right? It can be two, it can be three, it can be a thousand, it can be a million, it can be anything. Any number bigger than one is considered poly. And mer again means unit. So what they're trying to say over here is that they are combining many small little molecules or units to form a bigger unit, one big molecule. In case of ethene, lots of ethene molecules join together to make the polymer, which in this case is known as polyethene. We commonly call it polyethene. Molecules simply add on to each other without anything else being formed. So this is known as addition polymerization. So basically polymerization is a reaction in which uh, little molecules or monomer units join up to form one big large a macromolecule, which is known as a polymer. Now, in addition polymer, the addition reaction takes place. We only add the monomer units. We don't take anything out of it. And it forms one single product that is the macromolecule polymer itself. When I use the word macromolecule, I mean a giant molecule, a molecule that usually consists of thousands of atoms joined together. Now, take a look at these different ethenes. There are many more ethenes present over here with a little bit of heat using high pressure and an initiator. An initiator is something that can start the process. You can't call it a catalyst because it is consumed in the reaction, hence a different name, and that is initiator. You can get a big long chain, a chain having identical monomer molecules joined together. It's more like a necklace formed out of beads. Consider every molecule as a bead and this as a necklace. So this chain length can vary from 40,000, 4,000, all the way to 40,000 carbon atoms. So we must be joining at least uh, 2,000 monomers in order to make this one big chain, even at its smallest. Moving on, Extension work says that people occasionally wonder what happens at the ends of chain. They don't end tidily. Bits of the initiator are bonded on the either end. You do not need to worry about what happens to the ends of chains, all right? So for normal purposes, polymerization reactions are displayed like this. What you're supposed to do is to write the monomer and use the number N with it. Normally, for chemical equations, we use small whole numbers to actually balance the equation on both sides. Here, we're not going to do that. As the chain length can vary from anywhere from 4,000 to 40,000, we are simply going to use the letter N. Now, as we said earlier, the double bond breaks apart. So, what you're supposed to do is to draw the whole structure, but with a single bond and not with a double bond. As soon as you draw single bonds, you would notice that this carbon is capable of making forming one more bond over here, and this carbon is capable of forming one more bond over here. We leave the bond signs as is. 
the convention is to draw a bracket that literally intersect through these single bonds on both ends. So make sure you draw the single bonds, make sure you draw the bracket in such a way that the bracket literally intersects at both ends, the single bonds. When it intersects the single bond, it gives a depiction. The depiction is commonly known as continuation is, and is often mentioned in marking schemes. Marking scheme, in marking scheme, the word continuation means that you have intersected these brackets out of these single bond signs on both ends, which means the chain would continue over here with the similar monomer molecules and over here with the similar monomer molecules too. All right. So just yeah. about these blue portions, which were shown over here, can be shown by an intersecting bracket. Now, you should easily distinguish between monomers because they have a double one, not the intersecting brackets. And the polymer, which has actually just one repeat unit of this without the double bond and with the continuation, this is a repeat unit. Take the brackets out, it would need node can be taken as a repeat unit, put the brackets in, it would be known as a polymer with the repeat unit and the continuation. Now there is a key point that in this structure, polythene N represents a very large, but a variable number. It simply means that the structure in brackets called the repeat unit repeats itself many times in the molecule. When representing a polymer, the bonds on the two sides of the repeat unit should extend outside the square brackets to show that the carbon atoms are joined to the next ones in the chain as we have explained on top. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So next comes the part uses for polythene. Polythene comes into two types, low density polythene, which is abbreviated as LDPE and high density polythene HDPE. Low density polythene is mainly used as the thin film to make polythene bags, the shopping bags we commonly use at markets uh, and other places. It is very flexible and not very strong. Although the polymer is called polyethene, it is actually an alkane. The polymer is saturated and will not decolorize bromine water anymore because one bromine water can only be decolorized by unsaturated molecules. The polymer is now a saturated molecule. All right. High density polythene is used where greater strength and rigidity are needed. For example, plastic bottles, milk bottles. You will find a recycling sample with the letters HDPE next to it. When the bottle is made out of high density polythene, this is the recycling symbol that we commonly draw with three arrows. This symbol is recycling. Usually a number is written right in between this recycling symbol. Numbers for plastic range from one to all the way seven. I believe I'm a little unsure, but number three uh, maybe represents HDPE. However, very next to the symbol, HDPE would also be mentioned for anything made out of plastic, be it a plastic bottle or a plastic chair, maybe a plastic crate, maybe a rope made up of plastic, anything like that would have this recycling symbol and HDPE written very next to it. Okay? Yeah. All right. So moving on. How to deduce the polymerization reaction for any alkene? It's pretty simple. Now, what you need to do is to keep the four parts on top and at bottom of alkene in the similar way in the square brackets. Just break the double bond apart and put that as a continuation on both sides of carbon atoms. Balance the whole equation by putting an N over here and N at the bottom of the polymer. These are the worldwide conventions, universal conventions. Every chemist, every scientist, every student, every teacher follows the same convention. So you're supposed to do. All right. Yeah. So this is the whole thing you need to do with every single polymerization product. Now, there are many other polymerization reactions in the upcoming part of the book, but I suggest we do it in a whiteboard as for your practice. Doing it on a whiteboard, make sure that the student practices all by himself. So just to make sure that you get the point, I'm going to rewrite 
the whole thing again, and we're gonna use an N, I'm going to use brackets just to make sure that you understand it. I'm gonna quote the words polymerization so as to depict the little bit of temperature, pressure and initiator that we used all consumed by just one word. Writing the word polymerization gives the examiner an idea that you are using some temperature, you are using some pressure, you are using uh, an initiator. Go ahead. Now for the naming, addition polymerization are easiest when it comes to naming. Just add the word poly as a prefix to the name of the monomer. And there you go, you have the name of the polymer. So from ethene so, to polyethene, very easy. Yeah. So go ahead also write the damn name again, All right? So that's what we are going to do. I'm going to give you the structure of the monomer. You are going to do three to four things for me. First, you're going to draw the correct structure with the continuation uh, for the polymer. Secondly, you're going to balance the equation for me. Thirdly, you're going to name the product for me. Okay. In case of ethene, the formula was pretty simple. CH2 double bond CH2 that was converted like this. So remember, the doubly bonded carbon atoms are to be written at the center and the rest is to be arranged in four points like this. The next structure we have on the list is e propene, which is something like this. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm going to take this carbon atom over here, then the double bond and this carbon atom right over here. Now this carbon atom has two hydrogen atoms. So let's draw it like this, two hydrogen atoms. This carbon atom has one hydrogen atom, but one methyl group. So what I'm gonna do is that one methyl, you may write CH3, you may write H3C, both ways it is considered correct, okay? So that's what we were supposed to do. I'm gonna erase these so that you can have a good idea what we were talking about. Okay, name is propene. Go ahead, do all these three steps for me. Right. Well done. So I think it's easy, right? Yeah. Let's go for more practice. This time I'm going to do it slightly differently. This time I'm going to draw the polymer and you are supposed to make the monomer molecule for me, all right? Because yeah. that's also been a part of past paper practice. Sometimes they give you the monomer to be converted it into polymer. Sometimes they give you the polymer so that you can convert it back into monomer units. Go ahead, you may start.
what should be the name of the monomer unit? This is not ethene. Ethene has all four hydrogen atoms. This has all four fluorine atoms. Oh. Try taking the name out of the polymer name that I wrote. Remember the convention, the monomer name is added with a prefix poly in order to form a polymer name. So we must be doing something in return to convert that name of polymer back into monomer. No, this is still not correct. Remember, we only mm -hmm. add poly to the, as a prefix to the word. Oh, so it's tetrafluoroethene. Right, tetrafluoroethene. The complete name would be tetrafluoroethene for the monomer, as the polymer names is poly tetrafluoroethene. Make sense? Yeah. Good. Okay, yeah. all right, further practice, because uh, this calls for uh, at least five monomers practice. We just practice three, let's practice a couple more mono monomers. Okay, again, I'm going to give you the polymer. And you're supposed to make the monomer out of it. My bad. Right? I guess this was easy. This time I'm yeah. going to again go with the monomer structure and you are supposed to draw the polymer for me. This time I'm going to use a pretty big molecule. And name is Tyrene. Well done. Thank you. So this completes almost five different examples for us. Let's get back to the book and let's see which examples we have over there. And in the book, what they are going to do is that they're going to discuss the properties of that material, how that material is used in industry or in daily life or stuff like that. Let's start with propene. They're also going to go with Although I can't hear you. Yeah. Uh, they are also going to go with some different usages and how the question then can be tricked a little. If that's not a part of the book, I'll do it uh, on the whiteboard portion again. 
all right how the question can be twist or tricked into different ways let's start with propene we are already done with this part so i hope you understand how they code propene over here i it can be better understood by this example because this is the example that would come as a part of exams and i think it's pretty easy when you see this right how the yeah. monomer is converted into the polymer or vice versa now when you draw an addition polymerization reaction never change anything except opening out the double bond and drawing the continuation if you change the structure you might change the identity of the monomer monomer or the polymer as a whole which will be taken as a mistake as i was discussing the recycling signs coming to the next part uses of polypropene you would see a big recycling sign with number 5 in it pp is actually the abbreviation for polypropene it is somewhat stronger than polyethylene it has more resistance it is used to make ropes braids and even stuff like parachutes moving on next up is chloroethene chloroethene is something which i gave you by the name of vinyl chloride as you can see it's also mentioned over here so when we polymerize it the name of the polymer is polyvinyl chloride we commonly also call it pvc the big green balls that you can see over here are actually chlorine atoms in this model you would see the same thing over here it's just that you would notice that i never put the cl on the same carbon atom or the same position as they did which means they can slightly twist it this way for example if you see in your book that the monomer is drawn with the chlorine atom over here in exams they can might give you the same structure with chlorine atom drawn over here this does not make a difference not at least at least at this level it does make a difference in industry but not over here as we are only doing it theoretically makes sense yeah the same thing is covered in the hint over here okay i think this one's easy too shall we move forward yeah moving forward to the uses of polychloroethene or simply speaking pvc polyvinyl chloride now it has a lot of uses it is pretty strong it is very rigid it can be used for water pipes or replacement windows it can also be make, made flexible by adding plasticizers which are actually chemicals that can make plastic a little bit flexible so that you can mold it into different shapes this makes it useful for sheet floor coverings even for clothing these polymers do not conduct electricity they are not soluble in water therefore pvc can be used for electrical insulation and for piping water pipes sanitation pipes guttering pipes the list goes on now everything that is made out of pvc is shown over here you can see you see a cd cover uh, it's plastic the wall covering sheets the pipes that we usually make and sometimes the bottles and even their leads moving on tetrafluoroethene which can be polymerized into a polymer naming poly tetrafluoroethene the formula is cf2 double bond cf2 however something that i never told you in that is it's also registered by the name of teflon ptfe or the market name teflon is almost the same thing right what is teflon used for can be cleared at over here now you see the same equation that we wrote you would notice that it's almost equal to ethene it's just that every hydrogen atom in ethene has been replaced by a fluorine atom talking about uses of ptfe or teflon it is used as a non stick coating on pots and pans it's very unreactive due to the strong carbon fluorine bonds it can be found for the lining of containers for corrosive chemicals and we commonly use it on pans cooking pans now you can also work out the monomer for a, a given addition polymer this is the whole more big polymer written just take out a unit and write it as a doubly bonded structure there you get you will there you go no you will get the monomer let's practice a similar question over here
Now, out of this big polymer, what I want you to do is to identify a simple repeat unit and then convert that repeat unit, my bad, convert that repeat unit into a monomer, just like did on your right. Okay. Go ahead. Use a different color than black. Well done. Now, they are also explaining, let me clear that up. And they're also explaining something that C6H5 group is a pretty complicated group over here, but it does not matter how much complicated or unknown or irrelevant or relevant group they put over here. You're simply supposed to work with the double bond being converted into single and continuation. So this really does not matter which group is connected to which part of the carbon atom. Just derive the monomer from the polymer or the polymer from the monomer and you'll be good. Moving on, disposal of addition polymers. As addition polymers mostly result in plastics, recycling of plastics is very important, not just to save the raw material, because also it takes a very long time for addition polymers like polyethene and polychloroethene to break down in the environment. They contain very strong covalent bonds and a huge number of bonds, making them initially inert at ordinary temperatures. They're non-biodegradable, which means microorganisms cannot eat them. Decomposers cannot decompose them. So bacteria cannot work their way towards it. Simply speaking, bacteria cannot enjoy their parties on this kind of heap or dust, all right? One solution to problem of this disposal is to bury them in the landfill sites which is basically just big holes in the ground where they will remain unchanged for thousands of years. Let me tell you, the plastic bottle that we use for mineral water actually takes around 700 years to decompose naturally in the earth's crust. The bottles that are even thicker in their dia, not for the mineral water ones, the ones that we use for other beverages takes even more takes around a thousand years. So look at this heap and imagine how many years or how many centuries it's going to take to decompose naturally. That's why we use landfill sites. Some countries, including Denmark and Japan, incinerate or burn their plastic in order to tackle the problem. This releases a lot of heat energy, which can be used to generate electricity. However, there are problems associated with this. For example, Carbon dioxide is produced, which is actually a greenhouse gas and contributes to global warming. There are other gases, acidic or toxic included in the list. For example, this one is actually a toxic gas. It's poisonous and can kill human beings in under 30 minutes if they properly don't get oxygen and much, get much of this gas. Hydrogen fluoride, however, is acidic. It's not very toxic, but it can definitely cause problems being acidic because this can cause you allergies, uh, eye problems, reddening of eyes, soaring of eyes, runny eyes, runny nose, breathing issues, and then much worse condition if this is inhaled for a longer time because it can really hurt your bronchitis and your entire respiration pipes, right? So here are the advantages and disadvantages for either method. First one is landfill. No greenhouse gases or toxic gases are produced and it's pretty cheap. Incineration, it requires much less space. At least an 80% reduction of space occurs. 80% reduction. Why? Because ash takes much less space than the material itself. Weigh about one kg of paper. It would be a huge pile. Burn that up, you would see that this huge pile of paper will then be converted into a very small, approximately 20% of the original volume of ash. All right. 
That's why incineration requires very less space. Can produce heat for local homes, offices, or produce electricity from that. Disadvantages. Landfill is ugly, smelly, noisy. No one wants to live next to a landfill site. They use large area of land and waste will be there for thousands of years, which by the way, is not just inhabitable, sorry, uninhabitable. You can't live over there. Also, it's, you cannot grow crops over there. All right, because the crust of the land over there will be filled with toxic material and plastic waste. So the plants or trees won't be able to grow. In case of incineration, it is expensive to build and maintain the plant. It produces greenhouse gases, which you must get rid of. It releases toxic gases, which you must treat before you release them to the environment. The ash produced must still be disposed of in landfill sites. So at the end of this process, you gain lean a landfill site. Clear enough? Yeah. Okay, moving on. Condensation polymerization. Condensation polymerization is the second type of polymerization. Now, in this case, what happens is that we are not going to go with an addition reaction. We're going to do something different. First thing first, that we are not going to use a single monomer. Instead, we're going to use two different monomers. We won't be using double bonds and breaking them apart into single bonds. That was addition. What we are going to do over here is that we're going to work with functional groups. You might remember the ester reaction from the previous chapter. We use two different functional groups there, a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. The similar thing is being done over here. If you remember, we took hydrogen out of the alcohol and the entire hydroxide or hydroxyl OH out of the acid in the previous chapter to make an ester. Here, we're going to do the same thing. It's just that the monomers are slightly different. Take a look, it's a dicarboxylic, which means it's a compound which contains two carboxylic groups connected one to each end of the molecule. Whatever the molecule is, the easier part in IGCSC is that we don't draw the molecule, we instead show it with the box. So it becomes easy. Then we take a diol instead of simple alcohol. Again, it would uh, have an OH function group at one end and another OH on the other end. The best part about these dicarboxylic and diols is that we, make, we can make a huge chain out of it. Just put them in alternate order, a dicarboxylic, a diol, again a dicarboxylic, again a diol, and the loop goes on. So you can remove water out of every step where two different parts confront one another. Remove water out of every step, combine the rest, and you would see that the chain continues. You'll get a big polymer and a lot of water molecules. And this polymer is then known as polyester, not just ester, as we have polymerized an ester with too many ester linkages in the whole portion. This is known as a polyester. Make sense? Yeah. Now, it's gonna be a little tricky. Let me raise this part so that we can actually understand what's happening over here. Now at every step, take H out of the alcohol and OH out of the carboxylic acid. Again, H out of the alcohol, OH out of the carboxylic acid. Repeat the same thing no matter how many times the, uh, they are arranged in alternate manner. Every single time you do it, you remove a water molecule, combine the carbon and the oxygen at every step like you did back in the ester in the previous chapter, and there you go. You have the entire molecule polymer in front of you. What they did is that they circled, literally circled yellow, all the functional groups that were connected together after the water was taken out of it. So that to clarify that this is an ester group. So it's pretty easy. The blue box, ester group, red box, ester group, blue box, ester group, red box, ester group. Literally, it becomes too simple after that. Does it? Yeah. So we can obviously practice it. You can do it on your own. And 
you can make a polyester out of monomer units. Remember, you need a dicarboxylic and a diol, and those even in alternate manner. A dicarboxylic, then a diol, then again a dicarboxylic, again a diol, and so on and so forth. All right? Let's yeah. take a look at the monomers to understand the key points. One of them is a diol having OH at each end. One of them is a dicarboxylic having CWH at each end. The diol can be a different molecule, such as this one. One, two diol is the one that we can use. We can simply uh, use this, a different uh, one like this propane one, three diol. One, two tells you that the OH groups are attached at one, two number. One, three tells you that the OH are attached at one, three number. It's better that you use the alcohols which have both the OH connected to their corner carbons. Take a look. This OH is connected to this corner carbon. This OH is connected to this corner carbon. This OH to this corner carbon. This OH is actually connected to this carbon, corner carbon, not the center one. All right? Now, yeah. it's not a mistake with an extra E at the end of these names. We talk about propane-1-ol, but propane-1-3-diol. That's how it's named. You write the entire name of the alkane, and then you write the positions, and then you write the suffix for alcohol, which is ol, along with the prefix of how many alcohol groups are there. So ethane 1,2-diol or propane 1,2-diol are completely correct names. You're not supposed to take this E out of the name. That's how they're named. Make sense? Yeah. Moving forward. The second type of monomer was a dicarboxylic. It's pretty simple. This one is ethane one 2 uh, sorry, ethane dioic acid. Don't write one, two because it's already one, two. There can't be any other possible combination. However, with hexane, it's hexane one, six dioic acid because there is a long four chain carbon in between and on both ends, we have the carboxylic groups. However, you can use a simple one like this. Take a look. This is a simple diol with two carbon atoms in between and the functional groups at the corner this is again the functional groups at the corner, and actually there is no carbon in between ethane diol acid and ethane one two diol. That's how they are named. Make sense? Naming is not very important yeah. in IGCSE. Actually, combining them to form a polymer or to form monomers out of the polymer is much more important. Now, forming a polyester. Under the right condition, diol and dicarboxylic molecules join together. Now, instead, this time, they're not using boxes. They're using the entire structures. Even if they do that, I think that's not a problem. Keep the structures intact and do what you did with uh, forming water, taking H out of the alcohol and OH out of the carboxylic, and you'll just join the rest of the chain to form a molecule. There you go. So N of these, and N of these forms N of this. That's how it's made. Make sense? This, however, yeah. requires a little bit of practice because it seems a little bit tacky. Means how are we making so many atoms and molecules joining together? So once you join a structure like this, you can always take a repeat unit out, which is right from this part all the way to this part. This is one repeat unit. Again, this is the second one. So taking one repeat unit, you'll get this. Putting that one repeat unit over here with these brackets will give you a condensation polymer. Now it must be making much more sense. Does it? Yeah. yeah. Now, as soon as you identify the repeat units, like I did by make, drawing these boxes, it would make much more sense. So whenever you look at it, okay, let me again share the fact with you by which you can easily find out the repeat units. I know this is a single unit, but I know this one is a collection of repeat units. So let's start with it. A C double bond O is to begin with. So we're gonna begin over here and CH2O, we're gonna end over here. So all the way CH2O, and there you can to end it. So this is one repeat unit. And again, this is the second repeat unit. 
that's how I identified it. So you are supposed to take the starting point and match the starting point. You're supposed to take an ending point, match the ending point, and there you go. You will be able to identify the repeat unit like this. Make sense? Once you identify the repeat unit, it's easy to put it in continuation with the brackets. There you go. You're done with it. Yeah. Let's try it on a whiteboard. Yeah. Shall we? Because trying it yes. on a, it on a whiteboard uh, would make much more sense to it. One, two. Once you draw it with your own hands and you draw it correctly, you will be much more confident about it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna, going to write the whole thing over there and we're going to practice it over there. So let's stop sharing, go back to the whiteboard. Okay, so we are going to start with drawing the asset first. Sorry, not like that. Can't mess up on sign. Plus. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna use the red color to make sure that I take water out of it for water for water and for water. Using these color parts can make it extremely easy for the student to combine the rest of the structure. Take a look. It's pretty easy to come up with the correct structure. And I made, made a small mistake, so I'm gonna correct my mistake first. Actually, I was supposed to take H out, however, I took OH out of the alcohol. So I'm gonna write dicarboxylic over here. So this makes more sense. So does this one by writing a diol on top of this one. Okay. And then this O of course, brackets. And for balancing and for this one, and for this one, as I'm supposed to write N over here, but I don't usually write it because it confuses the student at start. As soon as the student has a better grasp, this does not confuse him anymore. So I'm writing N on top over here and here. Plus it gives you water molecules, all right? So that's how we come up with a repeat unit. Make sense? Yeah. Now, in order to practice it better, I'm going to change it a little bit. Let's say that we have a different dicar box like this time. I've changed the structure by just a CH2. And let's say that we have changed even this one, although this does not exist in actual, I mean, we don't use it for this purpose anymore, but just to come up with an example that you can solve, with a little bit of difference than the previous one. I hope this would work. Okay, go ahead, use a different color, take water molecules out, combine the rest, and then form the polymer. Also, don't forget to balance the equation. Go ahead. Okay, well done. 
But what if I tell you there is a small mistake with your polymer? Can you point it out? Oh. Oh, there's another CH3. Right, there's another CH2 over here. There were supposed to be three CH2s. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes more sense, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, can we get back to the book or do you want to practice more? We can get back to the book. Okay, this is for the polyester only. We have many other condensation polymers. Let's see how many are present as a part of your book. So moving on. This equation also does, tells us one more thing about the water molecules that we need to be careful for, which I never explained in the whiteboard as well as on the book. Take a look. It performs, gives us the same number of the N and N for monomers. It gives us a big N for the polymer, but two N number of water molecules, double the number of water molecules. This is just for the equation, but if you take a look at the extension work, you would notice that this is 2n minus 1 water molecules because there would be molecules that will have one OH at one end and the entire chain would have one C double OH at one end left at the end of the polyester molecule. So actually, number of water molecules are 2n minus 1. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you a question. If it makes sense, you should be able to answer it correctly. Let's say we had 100 units of this, 100 units of this. The chain length over here would be, I mean, if n is equal to 100 over here, that means that, sorry, let's so clear it up for you. 199 for water molecule? Yeah. Good. What about the chain length for the polymer? This in? It's easy. Would that Come just on. be 100? Right. That just be 100. This 100 yeah. depicts the length of the polymer chain. It would be 100 yeah. because we had both 100 uh, number of each of the monomer molecules. All right. Okay, yeah. so that's a pretty good way to understand it. Let's move forward. Let's see what we have next. Now, they are performing it with hexane 1,6 dioic acid, which means they're going to put in many CH2s, four CH2s over here, four over here. The ethane 1,2 diol is similar. As you have practiced with a different molecule already, so I think this would make much more sense now, right? Yeah. I hope you can do it yourselves. This is pretty similar. Blue box, the ester group, red box, the ester group, the blue box, the ester group, red box, the ester group, so on and so forth. So it, it's pretty similar to what we did back there with the boxes. It's just that the boxes are not written in box form as well as in structural form. Okay. Yeah. So the hint is that you should approach learning this. Think one of the monomers as a red rectangle with OH groups at the either end, the other one is a blue rectangle with carboxylic group at the either end, and the displayed formulae, line them up, remove water from them, connect the rest, and you would have a polyester with you, All right? Let's talk about polyesters as yeah. biodegradable materials. You were about to ask a question? No, no, no. Okay. So addition polymers, there are environmental issues with the disposable of condensation polymers. They are more reactive because of the ester linkage, but will all break down eventually. Although this could take hundreds of years, scientists have developed some biodegradable polyesters which break down much more quickly. They are called biopolyesters. 
biodegradable polymers can be made from lactic acid. Lactic acid is an acid that can be obtained from cornstarch. When it undergoes polymerization, it forms a biodegradable polyester, polylactic acid, which we also call PLA, which can be used making biodegradable plastic bags or surgery for internal stitches. It later on decomposes and is converted into its constituents, which do not even harm the body. Because if I know, go with this, do you, did you know part? Lactic acid, more properly known as 2-hydroxypropanoic acid, which has this structure, has both an alcohol and a carboxylic group in the same molecule. So it can polymerize with itself, or the term we use is self-polymerize, right? This also gives the definition of self-polymerization. A group, a molecule that has both the acid group and the alcohol group present in it. For example, if I mark it properly, there you go with the alcohol group and there you go with the acid group. So this alcohol group can give H out, this acid group we can get, give OH out, and then we can have the reaction going on within the same molecule polymerizing itself. Hence the name self-polymerization. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Amino acids, a group of compounds which can contain an amino group, the NH2 group and carboxylic group, hence the word acid, C double H groups can self-polymerize in condensation polymerization reactions too. Amine group is very similar to OH group in alcohols. Amine group is going to give its hydrogen atom, one of its hydrogen atoms, maybe this one. And the acid group, is pretty good at giving away its OH group, maybe this one. If all of this connects, it's going to form water and the rest of the structure would connect to form the polymer. So when amino acids join, join they form polypeptides, which make up the primary structure of proteins on the planet. Be those proteins a part of plants or the parts of, uh, parts of animals or our body, this is the very basis how our DNA is formed, how our cells are formed, and how our entire bodies come into being. Amino acids joining together. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So it's basically the same thing. It's basically another example of condensation polymerization. So apart yeah. from making polyesters, we had the PLA polylactic acid, and we have proteins or polypeptides coming from the monomers of amino acids. For this one, the monomer is lactic acid itself, right? So there are two more examples of condensation polymers in here, which actually finishes the chapter. <laughs>